a special Sky at Night now on BBC One with Patrick Moore. In 1927, before the age of television, England saw its last total solar eclipse. 30 years later, the sky at night was first broadcast. And now, 42 years after that, we can bring you our first total solar eclipse from British soil. We've come to the cliff tops of Cornwall. Near Falmouth, just across the water from St. Moors, is the Roseland Peninsula. And we are right at its very tip and St. Anthony Head, one of the last points on the English mainland near the central line of totality. We chose to come here almost five years ago. This particularly beautiful part of Britain is very promising for clear skies. Also, it's a wonderful vantage point. Look out to the west and, uh, we hope, see the moon shadow rushing towards us. As well as making our own careful observations, we are going to carry out several experiments. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined, as so often, by two of our most regular and welcomed guests on the sky at night, Dr. Peter Catamore and Ian Nicholson. Now, Ian, interestingly, you're a solar expert. And this is your very first total eclipse. I know I feel a bit of a fraud in a way, but what I really want to do, because it is my first time, is just to experience the atmosphere of it, to see it for myself, and uh, just soak in all the, all the atmosphere of the event. Very wise, I think. Now, Peter, of course, as a lunar geologist, you and I have seen several eclipses together. Oh, we have, Patrick. We've seen very successful eclipses from a whole range of places, but what always astounds me is how rapidly everything happens. For instance, just before totality, we'll see the dark moon's shadow racing at about 1,800 miles an hour across the bay towards us, and then the light level will begin to drop drop and what I propose to do is use this very simple camera light meter, point it up into the sky and record how the needle swings and then do the same after the eclipse and then after it's all happened get some graph paper, draw a very simple graph and we'll have a record of how the light levels changed and when. And of course that will work even, even if it is cloudy? Completely weatherproof Patrick, very simple. Ian, um, you have a second experiment, and this one again is cloudproof. Oh, yes, this one's totally cloudproof. A little earlier on, before all the excitement started, we uh, set, up, uh, set up a cassette recorder tuned to a distant radio station, Radio Marseille, down in the south of France. And the idea is simply this. There is in the ionosphere, the upper reflective layer of the atmosphere, uh, a layer called the D layer, which tends to absorb radio signals during the daytime. But when the sun's not there at night, the D layer dissipates, and you tend to get better reception of distant signals. Now, there is a notion that perhaps, to some extent, this might happen during the total phase of the eclipse. So we've got this cassette tape running, it's tuned to that station. We'll check it out afterwards and see if we've picked it up. Well, again, we wait and see it. Cloudproof. Now, Peter, what about your shadow bands? This is more problematical. Well, these, these aren't cloudproof, that's all. They are more no. problematical. But what happens is where the sun is near totality and is a, a, almost a point source of light, the beam from the sun interacts with the oscillations in the Earth's atmosphere and it c causes these ephemeral features called shadow bands when light and dark bands pass across the surface of the Earth. And what we're going to try and do is, is film these with this video camera, see if they move across the board. Um, and I think we've got about a two in a hundred chance of being successful, but I think it's worth a try. Have you ever seen them? Never seen them at any eclipse. I have once only vaguely. Well, I see you have a slight chance. I think, frankly, my experiment has less than that. We are now at the maximum of the Perseid meteor shower. Just imagine a brilliant meteor flashing by the eclipsed sun. What a picture that would make. And of course, way back in 1882, even before my time, a bright comet was seen near the sun. Well, chances of a brilliant meteor or a comet are very, very slight, but um, I'm going to take wide field exposures and just hope, and one never quite knows. So, all we need now is a nice, clear sky. As the sun set for the last time before the eclipse, we wondered if, in fact, red sky at night would bring astronomers' delight the next day. If it's like this tomorrow, we're laughing. Absolutely. It really was perfect, wasn't it, this evening? Mm. Yeah, I'd rather not have seen that forecast, <laughs> actually. I've, uh, well, there's nothing we can do about it, so we just have to go for it. Not a thing. Well, are we all really, that's the whole point. I think so. Uh, yeah. Mind you, I'd like a bit of advice from you chaps, because this is my first eclipse. And, oh, yes, uh, of course it is. Yes, think, thinking about... What? Newcomer? You know, <laughs> absolutely. Thinking about the size of the corona and how much you tend to see visually. Well, four or five sun diameters anyway. It should be fairly symmetrical. It's from the Sunday and the Earth's uh, silver maximum. Absolutely, yeah. It should, it should get some prominences too. 
but you reckon you can see out that far oh, on, you can. on, on you a good the old, road. Oh, you can quite definitely. Well, the other thing is, I suppose, it's the old business of it sort of becomes night in daytime, and even if it's cloudy, it sometimes mm -hmm. burns a hole, doesn't it? It sort of mm -hmm. the atmosphere settles down. So even though the forecast's bad, even if we miss the first few seconds of totality, when the sun switches yeah. off, it mm -hmm. sometimes the cloud just dissipates. Well, I'm going to pick away and try and hit my wide field photographs. And what are the chances of a comet or a meteor? Do you think? <laughs> No. One, in several, one in several yes, million. I think, I think a meteor's. Yeah, it's it's just my I was wondering about whether, what do you think about Mercury, Patrick? Because you're, you're a sort of early morning guy that gets up and. Oh, I think it's Mercury. It's quite high, isn't it? Well, Merc I don't forget Mercury is brighter than any, any, any star mm. I think Mercury is it. Venus and Mercury. Then they've got the rest, though. But We're not going to see Bailey's bees at the beginning, I think we're going to see them at the end, you know. If we see them at all, so, if we see them at all, that's what happens. No, what I was thinking was it is cloudy, yeah. and yeah. and the fact that the thing switches off allows it to clear. Yeah. We're yeah. probably going to have the best bit of the eclipse mm. in any case. Mm. I, I kind of well, I'm just going to go with it. Let's hope it's the lap of the gods. Yeah, oh, that's right. I always said that. Are you all right, yeah? Well, eventually we did get some sleep before an eager early rise on the great day. Don't like this. What do you think? Not a lot. No, it's not very good at it. Depends what's behind it. Well, that's right. It's still quite bright, and there is some brightness yeah. over there. It's like a good old Sheffield day to me. Yes. Well, <laughs> all we can do is wait and see. And we weren't the only ones with our eyes on the clouds. Hundreds of eager eclipse chasers had started early to pick a good viewing site. But by 9.57, the clouds were even thicker. And our first view of the eclipse came from an RAF Hercules flying above the clouds. First contact, the moon has started to pulse under the sun, and the great eclipse has started, and sadly, at the moment, from here on St. Anthony Head, we can't see it, because the sky is totally overcast, only a slight brightening where the sun we know is. And, well, I fear we've got to wait. My God, we're still well over an hour from Tetley, and I haven't given up hope yet. What do you think, Peter? Well, it doesn't look too good, I actually, looking on the light meter. It's, it's dark is setting its spin since we started, and it certainly shouldn't start to dark it until for about another 30 minutes. Well, yeah, there well, may be a way. I'm usually a pessimist, but I actually got a very faint, hazy glimpse of sun a moment or two ago, so well, keeping fingers crossed. We have got over an hour yet, you know, so we we'll, all we can do is keep on watching the breeze, but just hope we have a clear patch. Well, 20 minutes in now, not a large chunk of the sun covered, and still not a break in the sky, and not much chance, I fear. It's looking pretty gloomy, but uh, certainly the moon's what about a third of the way over the face yeah, yeah. of the sun now, and there's some rather nice sunspots there. <laughs> yeah, they can see at the least lift from the Hercules. Too. So, um, uh, a particularly nice sunspot group. In fact, they'll disappear very shortly. Interesting to note that the, the moon is far darker than the sunspots. So the spots are not really dark at all. Absolutely right. Yes, and the spots, the surface of the sun's about six thousand degrees, and the spots are just over four thousand degrees. So if you took a spot away on its own, it would really be quite bright. Yes, the moon, of course, is not. Absolutely well, right. temperatures, Peter? Any? Well, I think the temperatures have nothing to do with what's going on above the clouds. <laughs> it's been 66 degrees ever since we've been sitting here. Um, the light level has gone down a little, but it's nothing to do with what's happening up there. It's simply the cloud, I'm afraid. Won't a lot of them yeah. I'm afraid. We wouldn't expect ha much to happen yet for another 15 minutes, I wouldn't think, at the very least. And um, no weather changes either, no, no breezes or anything so far. Mm, it's fairly constant, isn't it? Fairly constant. I think, yeah, we're just waiting for the rain to come across, I think. Probably. I'm afraid you're right. Well, I haven't entirely given up hope, but after all, remember, it can clear dramatically at the last moment, and we never know, but uh, it doesn't look really good at the moment. It's in infuriating. The grandest specter of all time is going above us, and we can't see it. Mm. There's a break. Look there, there's a break in the cloud, and there is the crescent sun. We're about 15 minutes from totality, and we've just had our first glimpse of the eclipse. And the cloud is there, it's drifting, and there may be hope yet. Look, you see there, the crescent sun, and not very long to go now. Oh, clouds, keep away, please. Totality, and the light fades, and down here, we can't see it. From the aircraft, of course, we can, but from this ground, I fear we are going to miss the territory. There's cloud up there, but you can see the light level going down, the temperature drop, kind of eerie half light, not like an ordinary dawn or dusk at all. But I very much fear, from here we won't see the corona, but of course, from the aircraft we can, and the last sliver of the sun vanishes, and then there's the territory, the diamond ring, and there the lovely corona, a maximum type corona, beautifully symmetrical, and that is the sight of a lifetime. From down here, sadly, we are still under total cloud and we're missing it. The sky has gone dark 
and the entire landscape is altered now. And that is totality, lasting for two precious minutes. And down here, all we can see, I fear, is gloom. A few scattered breaks on the cloud, but unfortunately nowhere near us. And note how jet black the moon is compared with the sky. And see the structure in the corona, see that very clearly. The sun's atmosphere stretching away into space. And there's nothing quite like that. The glory of a total eclipse. And if you look closely at the corona, at 2 o'clock and about 5 o'clock, you can see two huge prominences, columns of glowing red hydrogen gas, which stretch thousands of miles from the sun into space. Two really amazing prominences. And down here, despite the clouds, as you look west, you can see the sky brightening as the edge of the moon shadow rushes towards us at 1,800 mph. And as suddenly it has started, totality will soon be over. Looking back at the sun, we're waiting for our first glimpse of the sun from behind the moon, the diamond ring. Wait for it. And there it is. There is the diamond ring, as you can see. Already the corona is fading. Pondus have now gone. The sky is brightening. And there the diamond ring increases. And now the light floods back across the landscape. And the great eclipse is finally over. And it was an amazing sight, too. Well, and nature wasn't kind, but it was a weird experience, wasn't it? It certainly was, yes. I mean, obviously, I'm bitterly disappointed oh, not Lord. to have seen the eclipse in uh, reality, but it really was weird with this build-up of black cloud and this heavy black shadow and the darkness coming. It was really quite extraordinary and out of this world. Amazing experience. Well, I've missed one before in Finland on the club. It wasn't like this. What about you, Peter? Mm, yeah, well, I was obviously terribly disappointed to miss, miss that wonderful thing, but it was odd. It's the first one I've missed, I suppose. I should be disappointed, but that shadow was worth being here for. It was just, it came so fast, it got so dark so quickly. Uh, so it was almost like a big black hand coming across the landscape. So I, it was worth it for that, but I'm, I, I still feel cheated. I think I do too. Mm. And after all, the aircraft pictures show it really was a lovely eclipse. Indeed. Well, yes, I mean, we got our prediction for Bailey's Bead spot on. They were down on that southwest limb, southern limb to start with. and where we suggested in those deep lunar valleys at the end. So at least we got that right. It was nice that they got some excellent pictures. And a brilliant corona too, a black corona. Absolutely splendid corona mm. with all the structure, detailed structure and uh, symmetrical all around the sun as you'd expect coming up to maximum. And of course some very fine prominences too. Mm. So well, very good there. Disappointing for us. But after all, the eclipse isn't over yet. The track is crossing Europe. Let's hope people there fare better. Well, they did. The skies of Alderney were clear enough to show the partial phases, and totality was seen through thin cloud, with the ports of a previously unseen phenomenon, parallel dark bands across the sky. You don't quite know what they were. By the time the moon shadow reached France, conditions were good enough to show some more details of totality, showing the huge promises in great detail. And they really were superb. Look at that one, around about five o'clock in the clock face. That's really the beauty, stretching far into space. One of the best prominences I've seen during the eclipse. And there on the right-hand side, a piece of material thrown right away from the sun. Again, you can see there the corona, and the structure in the corona, and again, the diamond ring is appearing, and the eclipse there is now over. As the shadow moved across Germany, the weather wasn't so good. The thin cloud about Stuttgart produced another eerie view of the eclipse, and there we see a decidedly hazy corona. You can see the prominences there. Not too bad a view, at least you get the general idea of it. But, of course, it was... a um, by the knot of a thin cloud, and there the diamond ring. You can see that again, the diamond ring is appearing, and there, since Stuttgart, the eclipse is over. A reasonable view, I suppose, but from Munich, on the other hand, they were unlucky. They were completely carried out and caught in a downpour. It wasn't until Tetelity reached the Alps that the skies were once again clear enough to allow some more beautifully detailed pictures of the eclipse. This wonderful picture, taken through a driven telescope, shows the structure of the corona, as well as those beautiful enormous prominences. Look there, about three o'clock in the clock face. That is a really magnificent prominence. You see the structure of the corona beautifully shown there. That's probably the best picture yet, and clearly taken through a telescope being driven to follow the motion of the sun and the moon across the sky. And it's very, very steady, as you can see. The shadow moved at its slowest over Romania. And at Rundical Vulture, the place of longest totality, the clear skies allowed wide enough views to show the planet Venus. And totality here lasted for 2 minutes, 23 seconds, and the skies were perfectly clear, and the corona showed up really beautifully, as you can see from this wonderful picture. The shadow crossed the Black Sea, and then it reached Turkey, 
clear skies gave more stunning views of this marvelous eclipse. And look at the chromosphere there, beautifully displayed, and prominences on the left-hand side. The skies there were perfectly clear, no cloud at all. They had a marvelous view. The shadow was again picking up speed, and around one o'clock, when totality was seen above the clear skies of Iran, it lasted for just over two minutes, and the populace was suitably impressed. And again, you see the lovely colonel there. By the time the eclipse reached Pakistan, the sun was so low that totality lasted for a little more than a minute. The last place on Earth to see the last eclipse in the millennium was India. Then the sun and the moon went their separate ways. One of the best views of the eclipse was from space. The view from the weather satellite, Meteosat 6, shows not only the pattern of the clouds above Europe, but also the path of the moon's shadow as it crosses the continent. But you can't even see where we were in Cornwall. Well, at least some parts of Europe did see the magnificent sights of totality. The Cornish weather may have spoiled our view, but two of the experiments by Peter and Ian did provide interesting results. This is the tape we've been running, and as you can hear, there's uh, nothing on it but static. We certainly haven't picked up uh, Radio Marseille either before, during, or after totality. What we're looking for here is the possibility that the D layer, the absorbing layer in the ionosphere, thins out during totality, and in that case we might have hoped to pick up a signal coming from Marseille, skipping off the ionosphere and bouncing back down to us here near Falmouth. Uh, what we had been hoping to hear was uh, Radio Marseille coming through, as indeed it did quite clearly last night. As you can hear there, but uh, today I'm afraid the effect of the eclipse on the ionosphere was not sufficient for us at least to pick up anything skipping off the ionosphere from Marseille during the day. But of course the Rutherford Apple Laboratory is collating results from all over the country and it may well be that uh, other observers with receivers in other locations are in the light, right sort of location to pick up a signal of that kind. So the fact that we haven't detected it doesn't necessarily mean that the effect doesn't happen. Well, let's face it, the shallow bands experiment really didn't work, but the, the light experiment was really quite a success. Got quite a good graph here. Yeah, well, I started running at about 10 o'clock and the meter was up here at about 6. Uh, it was kept sort of vaguely steady as the weather changed, I suspect. And then when that first bad weather came in, it did a quite a dive down to a level of about eight. It passed, went back up again, leveled out. And then it uh, dropped from about 11.05 very steeply all the way down into totality here. At, I got down here 11.13. And then started to rise again almost as quickly. And then seemed to slow down a bit for some reason, which I don't entirely understand. Came up here to a level of about eight and kept more or less at that level, didn't rise back up to where it was before totality. So I, I sort of kind of feel that was a pretty successful little experiment, so I was quite pleased with that. We'll bring you a final roundup of the eclipse next month. For more astronomical information, you can visit our website at www.bbc.co.uk slash or CFAX page 620. Well, from Cornwall, we didn't see the corona, but the results were positive. Our experiments did work. Other people did see it. And you know, in a curious kind of way, being under a leaden sky during a total eclipse is a strange, eerie experience that I, for one, will never forget. Until next month, good night.